Good morning. Um, we're just giving some extra minutes for more people to, to attend. Um, this is going to be the, the first workshop of a series of workshops. Uh, the Equality Unit seeks to co-organize throughout the academic year uh, in conjunction with um, the different departments of the university as well as um, the PhD school. And the idea is basically um, to provide more information, to provide um, role models on how to mainstream gender into research. Um, the gender dimension is actually one of the pillars of the European research area. It's uh, an integral part of the European Research Council and the funding schemes. Uh, so it's very beneficial for um, everyone to know at the early stages of the PhD or at any stage of your research um, um, position to get to know how to mainstream um, gender. Uh, addressing the gender dimension into research has to do with taking into account how the different political, social, economic uh, phenomena, health issues, technologies affect or potentially affect differently men and women, right? And by um, including this um, sensitive approach, research becomes, becomes more useful for society, um, uh, for our society, right? Um, it is my pleasure to, to have the chance today to introduce you to Professor Anne Phillips. Uh, she's professor of um, uh, she's uh, um, professor at the Depar uh, Department of Government at the London School of uh, Economics and Political Science. Uh, she's a very prestigious political theorist. Uh, she's made several contributions um, to, to the study of uh, democracy, representation, equality, and, and difference. Uh, she has an extensive publication um, record with books such as uh, The Politics of the Human, The Politics of Presence, Engendering um, the Democracy. She's received um, several awards. And um, uh, this uh, very first uh, workshop focus on, on theory, even if it's political theory, is also uh, related to the fact that the integration of the uh, gender dimension into research affects all phases of a research project. So it also affects the ideas we have when we uh, start uh, conceiving a research, the research question, the hypothesis, then it will have other consequences on, on the methods and uh, knowledge transfers, knowledge transference, but since it also has to do with how we to use ideas to organize our research questions and conceptualize our um, research, I think it's very appropriate to start with uh, one session on, on theory. Um, as said, this very first session is sponsored by the Department of Political Science at the UPF. Uh, Maria Jose Gonzalez, the coordinator of the PhD program, sends her apologies. She is out of office today in a project meeting outside Barcelona, so she couldn't um, make it. Um, so without further uh, delay, I leave you with um, Dr. Anne Phillips. The floor is yours. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, Dan. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Phillips will talk for about uh, 40 minutes, and then we'll have an extra 40 minutes for discussion with questions, comments, um, etc. Thank you. Yes, thanks. So, um, and, and we're a, a good-sized group, I hope, to have good discussions. So I'll just start with some uh, general things that I want to say, and then, uh, then we can talk not just about those, but about a range of other things that you might want to talk about. So I, I wanted to start by... Uh, saying something about recent trends in political science and political theory. Um, and I'm speaking, I mean, I'm, I'm as, as Tanya says, I'm at the government department at the London School of Economics. I'm speaking very much from my experience within my department, more broadly within uh, UK universities, and perhaps a bit more broadly within English language speaking um, political science. But these seem to me to be kind of major trends in current political science, which pose certain problems, additional problems. <laughs> there have always been problems, but some new problems for thinking about gender mainstreaming. Uh, there's a move more towards uh, quantitative research. Well, that in, that in itself is not particularly a problem, except that in terms of uh, gender specialisms, 
um, a lot of gender researchers uh, have expertise in qualitative research, either as well as or instead of quantitative research. So that's one problem. There's a move towards more formal political theory, for example, the use of game theory, which is a kind of way of understanding what's going on in politics in which you don't actually study politics, <laughs> but you, you study in a sense, you, you engage in more trying to understand basic principles that might apply in any conflict or you know, decision-making situation. A move towards the use of experiments to test out claims about the ways people operate in political situations. So a move more towards a kind of, a, a sort of using aspects of behavioral psychology almost in order to try and make sense of political developments and changes. Again, much less grounded in knowledge of what's actually going on in any political situation. Um, I think some of the kind of the consequences of this, um, it seems to me that there's less focus on what I would call the bigger picture. So that a lot of people doing research in um, political science nowadays are, they're not asking really big questions about why you get you know, certain kinds of trends or developments within the nature of politics. Um, there's much more of a kind of preoccupation with adequate testing of hypotheses. So if, you know, when you get, you know, or you may already be at this stage of sort of sending journals, uh, articles to journals, uh, in a sense, having a very precise hypothesis, a very clear way of testing it. These are the things that so many of the journals now look out for, which is great in terms of rigor, <laughs> uh, but it does mean it favors smaller and less ambitious hypotheses. So I think there are all these kind of general trends going on in political science at the moment, some of which pose additional problems for the issue of, of gender mainstreaming. Now, political theory, which is my field, is to some extent insulated from these trends. Um, but there's a kind of parallel shift, and again, I'm speaking very much from my knowledge of the Anglo-American literature, uh, away from more broadly defined political theory uh, towards a more narrowly understood political philosophy, often closer to moral philosophy, um, so that, uh, so that it, for example, kind of questions about um, uh, how one might, uh, uh, questions about how one might kind of think about a kind of major political dilemma being reframed as a kind of extension of how as an individual you might address a particular uh, moral dilemma, which is then generalized up to the political level. Um, when political theory becomes more political philosophy of that kind, it becomes more focused on defining concepts and ensuring rigor of argument. Ensuring rigor of argument absolutely is a good thing. <laughs> uh, defining concepts, not always, because in my experience, a lot of what one is trying to do in political theory is to work out you take something like equality, democracy, representation, you're trying to kind of work out the ways in which these concepts work and operate, and often the kind of the tensions and the kind of contradictions embedded within them. So if you start in advance by saying, when I say, when I say democracy, I mean X, Y, Z, it doesn't always help the progress of your argument, but anyway. Um, but the thing that I particularly want to focus on today is that the way in which what happens in this is increasingly an abstraction for purposes of rigor from the kind of complexities of actual politics, which comes to be known in, polit in the political theory world as ideal theory, and in the process, very often an abstraction from gender or race. I mean, I think if you look at classical political theorists, you know, going back, you know, kind of Plato onwards, actually talked rather more about gender uh, than became the case in later political theory. Uh, there's been a kind of movement towards greater abstraction. Um, so just to give you some kind of examples of the, um, uh, so John Rawls, whose book A Theory of Justice in 1971 was a really kind of major, major influence in shaping a great deal of political theorizing from the 1970s onwards. And his project was to 
um, illuminate the nature of justice, right? So he was doing a big project. This isn't someone who's, apply, who's you, know, uh, you know, addressing some very, very small set of issues. Um, but in order to clarify the nature of justice, he said, well, let's assume that people are generally law-abiding. Uh, let's assume reasonably favorable social conditions. And within those, let's try and work out the nature of justice. Um, and as both feminists and critical race scholars uh, subsequently argued, if you do that, you're assuming away the history of misogyny. You're assuming away the history of racism. You're assuming away colonialism. And then you're asking us about the nature of justice. Shouldn't we start with injustice or inequality in order to try to get a better picture? Um, there's uh, an, an example by um, a former colleague of mine, Cecile Fabre, who wrote a really interesting book called Whose Body Is It Anyway? which is um, addressing, among other things, the question, uh, is there anything wrong with having markets, commercial markets, in human organs, you know, like a kind of a trade in, uh, in spare kidneys and so on, human kidneys? Uh, now, as she points out, many of the kind of the arguments that people use against a commercial market in human, or, in human organs depends on what she says are contingencies. It depends on uh, if, you know, if you look at the kind of the illicit <coughs> trade in human organs, there's a huge amount of deceit. People are kind of drafted into, they're persuaded to uh, undergo the operation to sell an organ without being given real information about the risks of the operation, without being given <coughs> any kind of aftercare, uh, cheated in terms of the kind of the money that they're given. Um, many people dying from illegal operations. Uh, and of course, what drives somebody to offer a kidney for sale is almost always, it's, it's economic desperation. Why else would you do it? And so, so she says, well, all of these things are true, but if you want to really try and work out what's wrong, if anything, with a market in human organs, you have to abstract from this. So let's imagine a world in which Nobody is driven by economic desperation, a world in which there is kind of, you know, a sort of everyone has access to what they need uh, for a minimally flourishing life, and a world in which the market in kidneys is legally regulated. And in that context, would you still be opposed to uh, a market in human kidneys? And you can see what she's doing there. You can see the point of doing that kind of abstraction, right? Um, but one of the problems with it is that it kind of leads political theory in a direction in which we don't actually engage with the actual inequalities and injustices of our world. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, so what I'm saying there is basically in a lot of contemporary political theory, a lot of political theorists will argue that it's precisely through, uh, through abstracting from what they might describe as the contingencies or the differences of gender, race, class, that we arrive at an understanding of what justice, equality, or freedom requires. And I think one of the things that's very characteristic of, of feminist work within political theory, people who are trying to kind of ensure that gender is taken very seriously within the development of political theory, uh, very typically the argument is that these abstractions obscure or solidify existing inequalities. So basically, if you just add in your gender later, and I'm sure this is going to be a theme throughout these workshops, because the kind of the, you know it's a problem that comes up in gender mainstreaming in any area of of uh, of research. If you add in the gender later, <laughs> rather than trying to find a way of getting it in there at the beginning, you're adding it to theories and concepts that have already legitimated not necessarily intentionally, but have already legitimated gendered understandings of uh, key concepts within uh, political theory, man, human, individual, citizen. They, they've already got gender kind of written into them in a problematic way, so just adding it in afterwards. So a quote from uh, uh, an essay by Susan Moller Okin, 40 Acres and a Mule, in which she was criticizing some of John Rawls' work. Um, which I think captures some of this quite well. Liberal political theory is deceptively individualist. It claims to have as its subjects human individuals who can exist independently of each other. So it starts with the individual and then it kind of develops out what, you know, what kind of politics we should think of. They're never helpless infants. 
They do not suffer from major or less than passing disabilities, mental or physical. They do not seem to pass into any kind of dependency on others. All of this fictional portrayal of persons as autonomous, self-sustaining, and even self-created beings serves to disguise a giant ambiguity. While liberal theorists claim to be writing about individuals, scratch the surface and you will find they are almost all actually talking about male heads of household. Um, and then there's a very similar argument that you find in the literature as regards race. So this is from um, a um, American theorist, Charles Mills, uh, who's, who's written um, very, very parallel work about how, how you address the kind of the, um, the way in which the, the refusal to engage with race or the history of colonialism or the history of slavery has kind of has distorted the development of political theory. So this is from an article of his on decolonizing Western political philosophy. And he says, the abstraction, he's particularly a political, he's very clearly a philosopher, right? As a political philosopher. The abstraction from the empirical, which is the defining feature of philosophy, is generally taken to justify the ignoring of such real life deviations as racism or colonialism, as, as is implied in what I said about John Rawls's work, because the important thing is the concepts involved. Uh, the aspiration to the timeless and universal then rationalizes an idealized form of abstraction, which through its obfuscation of the distinctive political experience of people of color in modernity, makes the representative political individual European. Whiteness, as racelessness becomes abstractness, becomes philosophical representativeness. And, and this is a very parallel kind of argument to the one that you get among people trying to explore the issues about gender in political theory. The representative individual, you know, who is presented as gender neutral, the individual, the human, the citizen. Um, uh, you know, the distinctive political experience of women is obfuscated, and this representative political individual uh, becomes male, by which, I, by which when, when I say male, I'm not talking about real men, <laughs> uh, but, but a kind of a way of thinking about what it is to be male or a way of thinking about masculinity that kind of gets into our understanding of the world. It's not necessarily corresponding to the actual um, practices of men. So, so this is, this is the problem that seems to me to be absolutely the central problem that has to be tackled <laughs> in mainstreaming gender in political theory, uh, particularly in the kind of liberal theory that's very much dominant in the kind of the fields that I've, um, that I've worked in. Um, what, what, you're, what you're faced with again and again is this very abstract, non-gendered individual. So the, when people talk about the individual, uh, the individual is imagined as gender neutral, but turns out uh, to carry characteristics that are coded as masculine, um, or that assumes background structures that are themselves gendered. So in the literature, there, there's a whole range of different versions of this. Not everyone has the same kind of argument, but you know, it might include, uh, so some people argue uh, there's a tendency within political theory to think of the individual as driven by self-interest. And then you get an argument which says self-interest is a kind of, is, it, it's an extrapolation from a way of living which is, which is kind of like ignores, which in a sense, it assumes a world in which somebody else <laughs> is taking care of the others, right? I mean, in order to be free to be self-interested, you have to have somebody else in the society who is taking care of the others. So it's assuming a kind of gendered division of work. It, uh, and in that sense, the self-interest is very much, it's a kind of coded as a masculine, a masculine quality. Uh, self-ownership, there's a similar kind of uh, argument that you find in the literature. There's an idea that when political theorists talk as if, as if we own ourselves, which is something that becomes very uh, important when you're addressing questions about um, questions about uh, prostitution, questions about commercial surrogacy, questions about the sale of human organs. Uh, the idea that you might think of yourself as owning yourself, again, there's, there's quite a lot of argument in the literature that this is, 
this talks about the individual in ways that writes into the characteristics of that individual things that are really only possible if you think of a kind of uh, arch archetypical masculine experience. Uh, one of the uh, uh, springing up like mushrooms is a, is a phrase from uh, Thomas Hobbes. Um, and it's been picked up by a lot of uh, feminist uh, political theorists about the way in which political theory imagines people just coming out of nowhere, right? Kind of completely abstracts from the fact that we are all, we're, we're born into, uh, into familial contexts in which we are cared for by somebody or other, in which we are dependent for long periods of our, of our existence on the care of others. Um, and this idea that somehow the individual just springs up like a mushroom uh, without any, any, any people around the individual uh, creating us who we are. Um, or, put that another way, the idea that you can think about, that you can think about what kind of um, employment practices do we want or what is, what is equality in the world of uh, work um, in which you ignore the fact that uh, historically the assumption was that men went out to work, not all, not all through history, through a period of history, that men went out to work and had a wife at home taking care of household, children, everything else. To simply generalize that and make it equally available to women just ignores the fact that the initial workers have these wives at home. So, you know, unless you have a wife, what? And so on and so forth. Now, so there's a lot of arguments in the literature about which are attacking the way in which the individual, which seems to be gender neutral, actually carries with it, him, all kinds of assumptions which reflect a very gender structured society. So what's the solution to this, right? Um, now, this is where a, a lot of feminists then, then disagree at this point, because a lot of feminists, quite a lot of feminists will say, you know, let's identify the ways in which these kind of very heavily gendered characteristics have crept into our understanding of the individual or the citizen or the human. And let's get those out and let's strive to a genuinely gender neutral conception. And that's one possible strategy. Um, I think one of, one of the problems, it seems to me, about that is that I don't know if this is a kind of psychological point or what, but it seems to me that, um, I mean, is it possible, given that we do live in gendered worlds, <laughs> is it possible for us to actually Im imagine an individual who is without gender? Is it possible for us to imagine a human being who is without gender? I mean, it's an extraordinary act of imagination. Maybe there will be some time in the future <laughs> when we can indeed do this, but it seems to me that it's that part of the problem is that given that we do live in societies that remain very much structured by gender, both in the way the institutions are organized and in the ways we've kind of come to think about ourselves, actually you use a notion like individual human gender and some gendered characteristics rush in <laughs> and fill the vacuum. So I think, I think part of the problem here is that just identifying that there's been a history of, you know, elision between seemingly gender neutral individual but actually masculinized individual and then saying, now we've noticed that, we can get rid of it. Um, that may be, that may not be so readily available. Um, so I think uh, that, so this, I, I think, do I have a quote? No, I don't know that I have a quote there. I thought I had a quote from, uh, let me just, yeah, let me just uh, go forward to this quote because it deals particularly with this. This again is a quote from uh, some early work by Susan Moller Okin and uh, she's saying you don't solve this problem just by changing the terminology that you use. So um, uh, at the time that she's writing, so this is the late 1980s, uh, it's already become the case that a lot of political theorists and philosophers have... Um, They've noticed that you know, there's this long history of talking about human beings and using the generic term man, right? And people have become quite self-conscious about this and they've realized that there's, there's clearly a problem about you know, saying man and, and imagining that it's supposed to include men and women. Or that there's a bit of a problem about always saying he 
whenever you talk about individuals or citizens, um, and assuming, pretending that this applies to both of us. So increasingly, if you look at contemporary political theory, uh, a lot of uh, moral and political philosophers now are very careful um, to try not to use this very gendered language. And indeed, if you look at the instructions of journals, uh, when they're giving you advice about things to think about when you're, um, I mean, I'm just pausing here because I'm thinking, is this very specific to which language you're writing in? And of course it is. But anyway, <laughs> um, so her comment, most contemporary moral and political philosophers now use men and women, not man, um, or he or she, or they talk about persons, uh, or the increasingly ubiquitous self. But they're merely terminological responses to feminist challenges in spite of giving a superficial impre impression of tolerance and inclus inclusiveness, often strains incredulity and sometimes results in nonsense. Gender neutral terms frequently obscure the fact that so much of the real experience of persons, so long as they live in gendered structured societies, does in fact depend on what sex they are. And one, she has this one very nice example which is um, taken from uh, a book by Bruce Ackerman, um, in uh, his book, Social Justice in a Liberal State. And he's, uh, he's an early um, advocate of this attempt to be gender neutral in his language. The problem he's discussing is abortion, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, so he, he talks about parents, right? So that the kind of the issue is about kind of, you know, the rights to abort and the relative rights of the fetus versus the rights of the parents. And, uh, and as Okin says, the impression, the impression is given that there is no relevant respect in which the parents differ in relation to this fetus. So that, I mean, it's a particular context in which, you know, I mean, to try and think about the issue of abortion without acknowledging that, that it's women who get pregnant. You mentioned language is a small parenthesis in Spanish. Yes, I was, I was just thinking as I was going on. Yes, do ca carry on. So, the, the, the Royal Academy, so it's, more, it's much more normative. So it's yes. Not different than Spanish, there is uh, one Spanish. Yes. Uh, which is by the Royal Academy of Spanish. Yes, yeah. And they, they have uh, uh, written against the, this kind of uh, he or she, uh, yeah. uh, let's say, way of, uh, of writing. And they have, they have actually ruled it incorrect. Oh, have they? Right. Uh, that, and yes. Have ruled it incorrect? Or yes, or, yeah, or yeah. stated that the correct yeah. form is, yes. is, the, is the masculine form and it's yes. not. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, because there, there, I mean, I know there'd been a kind of shift from, um, uh, what would be examples? Uh, did people used to just say uh, 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 um, professor, professor, and now people say professor, professora? Am I right? There's, there's been a shift. So a number of words that have now have both a feminine and a masculine usage, but, that, that, but whereas initially there was just a kind of masculinized or it might have been feminine. Um, but that's very, so how, do you know, how recent is that? It's uh, maybe the, within the last uh, month or something. Oh, okay, right, yeah, yeah. So a traditionalist that is, uh, <laughs> okay, that's a very nice example. Okay, so just, uh, oh yeah, just to go back to some of the, uh, some of the argument about why, why, why this abstraction is, is so significant. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that's quite striking is that, um, the capacity to represent yourself as without gender or without race is itself a mark of power. And what I'm thinking of here, when people talk about gender, you know, you can't, you can, I mean, it's quite true. You talk about gender, here am I, I'm talking about women, right? Uh, I'm not actually just talking about women because what I'm talking about is the, the construction of femininity, the construction of masculinity, you know, maleness and femaleness are part of that. But if you see the term gender, we take it as signifying women. Uh, similarly, if you, take, if, you, if you use the term ethnicity, which all of, all of us have an ethnicity, right? And you know, every human being in the world has a particular kind of ethnicity. But very, very commonly, it's taken to refer to groups who constitute a minority ethnic group within their society. So that you know, in, in Britain, people don't... Uh, people have become a bit aware of this, but people used to talk about the ethnics, right? Referring to people of minority 
ethnicity, right? So that kind of, part of what's going on there is that, in a sense, those who are in the positions of power, um, whether it's gendered power or racialized power, don't actually need to perceive themselves as having a gender or having a race, that it's always attached to the kind of ones who aren't in a position of power. So there's a very nice quote from uh, a book by Nirmal Pua, who says, uh, when a body is emptied of its gender or race, uh, this is a mark of how its position is the privileged norm. Its power emanates from its ability to be seen as just normal, um, to be without corporeality, its own gender or race, remains invisible, a non-issue. And I mean, that was uh, um, the study that she did there was a study of, um, I mean, the book is called uh, Bodies Out of Place. And it's a study of, uh, it's, a, it's a British study of um, women and people of minority um, ethnicity who were in positions, unusually were in positions of high influence within within the civil service, uh, within universities. I can't remember what her third area of study was. Uh, so, so people who were hyper-visual, everyone was very aware of them as women or as black people, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the, the others weren't perceived in terms of their gender or in terms of their race because they were just perceived as normal. So I think very much part of the challenge for a feminist political theory is to try to get beyond these abstractions. So there's that, that quote from Okin that the solution is not just to change the terms. Um, I mean, political theory, um, uh, the kind of political theory I do is, is very much um, uh, what you can call normative political theory. That is trying to work out uh, not just how we do think <laughs> about questions of equality or justice or um, democracy, but actually how we should think uh, about these. And, and I think the, the other aspect is that, that, you know, at a normative level, the kind of the abstraction from gender, which, which of course in many contexts is exactly the right thing to do, but in many other contexts can be an evasion. So the context in which it's the right thing to do, so forget the quote at the moment, right? The context in which it's the right thing to do, many, many kind of aspects of um, equal opportunities uh, or you're, you're developing a policy against discrimination. Uh, what you want is to get people to make decisions regardless of gender, right? So you want people to employ, employ people not on the basis of you know, do they fit in with the kind of the dominant group at the moment? Are they male? Are they female? Are they of the kind of dominant ethnicity or not? Uh, you don't want that. You want people to sort of just decide on the basis of, do they have the right qualifications for the job? Um, you don't want them to kind of decide on the basis of gender. So that's a context in which you would actually like people <laughs> to abstract from gender. Or if you were... Um, uh, admitting people to university as students um, and you don't want them to be making their decision on the basis of uh, what kind of name you have or uh, on the basis of what, uh, what sex you are. So that there are lots of contexts in which you really do want a kind of gender neutrality or you want people to abstract. But though even in those contexts, right, um, if you're trying to work out if there is systematic discrimination you need the information about um, you know, people's gender or people's uh, ethnicity in order to establish whether there is a pattern of discrimination. And if you were trying to apply some form of affirmative action, you might actually be in the context of choosing people or giving people a preference on the basis of gender or, or ethnicity in order to counterbalance an existing problem. So, you, so it varies. It's contextual. But the particular example that, that I want to kind of talk about, and this, this, is, this comes very much from my most recent work on the politics of the human, there's a very powerful um, impetus behind saying what matters is not whether you're male or female, or white or black, or straight or lesbian or gay, right? What matters is that we are all human beings. And it's a really, that's a really powerful statement of equality, inclusion, uh, which, you know, in, you know, 
as I say, very, um, I mean, it's very much meant as a kind of uh, a statement of, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't attach significance to this because what matters is that we are all human beings. However, there are some contexts, many contexts, in which that very generous impulse towards inclusion and equality actually is better understood as an evasion of reality. And this, this is a quote from um, Hannah Arendt, um, political theorist who, uh, she had a uh, Jewish political theorist who'd fled Germany in the 1930s, uh, eventually um, made her way to America, which is where she then uh, wrote and taught until her death in the 70s. And in 1959, um, she returned to Germany for the first time since she had left it um, in 1933 uh, because she was, uh, she was um, given an award, the Lessing Prize. And she made a speech um, in that context which reflected on, in a way, the emptiness of the notion of us all being humans together in the particular context of the politics uh, leading up to the... Um, the Nazi regime. So this is a quote from that. In the case of a friendship between a German and a Jew under the conditions of the Third Reich, it would scarcely have been a sign of humanness for the friends to have said, are we not both human beings? It would have been mere evasion of reality and of the world common to both at that time. They would not have been resisting the world as it was in keeping with the humanness that had not lost the solid ground of reality, the humanness in the midst of the reality of persecution, they would have had to say to each other, a German and a Jew and friends, right? And, and that, I think, comes back to kind of some of what I was saying right at the beginning, that if you kind of, if you try to think of a notion of inclusion, equality, uh, humanity, um, uh, that that simply kind of ignores all the ways in which there are injustices and inequalities, um, then that very generous gesture of saying, as far as I'm concerned, all of those differences don't matter, can contribute to an evasion of reality. There are contexts in which it's the right policy, uh, but not, uh, not by means all of them. Okay, so what I've kind of focused on in what I've said so far is very much uh, this critique of abstractions, which for me is, is an absolutely central feature in attempts to mainstream gender and political theory. I mean, I, th I think, you know, I mean, almost all of, um, I think almost all of the different things that I've, I've done and different kinds of issues that I've addressed in my own writing all in some way revolve around the challenge of addressing the abstractions which knock gender out of the picture, but without, um, in a sense, in the process, simply installing gender difference <laughs> as something that we end up kind of stuck with. So that's kind of, um, that to me is, is the really kind of central challenge in terms of mainstreaming gender in political theory. Um, there are, there are others, and, and you know, we can, um, of course, uh, you know, feel free to sort of talk about these others in our discussion. Um, the critique of essentialism. So, um, as I say, <laughs> you want to criticize abstraction without installing gender as, as something that is kind of like a sort of an essential difference between us. Uh, another very major part of what it is to mainstream gender in political theory is to... Um, is to challenge the ways in which uh, we operate with um, we operate with kind of generalization stereotypes um, uh, sort of notions of what it is to be male female masculine feminine uh, which which distort the kind of both the kind of understanding we have of society but also distort our image of what what a future society can be like. And I think, um, I think these essentialisms, it's not just about gender, there are essentialisms of culture, essentialisms of nation. Uh, these, these also are kind of very much need to be thought through. Um, a, th a, th a third uh, aspect that I'll just mention, I think generally uh, in those who do work uh, on gender in political theory or in political science, 
tend to be much more open to interdisciplinary work. And, and this kind of goes back a bit to what I was saying at the beginning about some of the recent trends within political science, which, um, which, which kind of, in a sense, narrow down the field of understanding of what politics is. I think a great deal of um, gender-based work tends to be much more open to interdisciplinary uh, work, to drawing on insights from history, sociology, normative political theory, um, trying to kind of think about uh, interconnections. Um, you know, so that, that tends to be one of the kind of the features. And also something I, uh, something I mentioned right at the beginning, um, there tends to be a much greater openness to qualitative work rather than the quantitative work, and this is particularly within political science. So we, we can talk about those. Um, but for me, <laughs> focusing particularly on political theory, it's been the critique of abstractions that has been the kind of the central challenge. The others are also an important part of what's going on. So I just want to end with a kind of just a, um, uh, just a couple of things about... There we go. Um, yes, uh, so I suppose this is uh, something of particular relevance for those of you who are uh, engaged in your PhDs or reaching the point where you're beginning to think about uh, uh, submitting articles for publication. Uh, recent research shows um, a very pronounced underrepresentation of women in the the journals that are regarded as the top politics journals. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing very much from the Anglo-American literature. Um, the exceptions, interestingly, are journals focusing on political theory and comparative politics. Those, those areas of political science have tended to be uh, more, op more open to uh, publication of articles by women. And in fact, um, the American Political Science Review, which uh, in political science departments is kind of... Uh, you know, commonly regarded as the lead uh, journal, got very, very anxious at one point, quite rightly, about how few uh, articles by women uh, were being published in the journal. And, uh, and in, the, in the end, they decided, um, actually, the only way they could address this uh, that they could see uh, was to decide that there should be a higher proportion of articles by political theorists, which then very significantly <laughs> increase the, uh, the proportion of uh, works by women. Uh, so uh, I've got um, just some information here by uh, a recent article um, by uh, Dawn Teal and Kathleen uh, Thalen, uh, which was based on their study of gender in the journals, which is kind of quite interesting. So they did, they analyzed output from the top uh, 10 American political science journals. So this is very, you know, this is very skewed to American journals. Um, and uh, compared the proportion of articles published by women to the proportion of women among uh, recently qualified um, uh, PhD students uh, or the proportion of women among the membership of the American Political Science Association, which is kind of quite an indication of you know, those, those who are in the profession. Um, and, uh, and they basically, they suggest two explanations. Uh, one is the um, underrepresentation in these journals of the kind of qualitative work that more of the feminist researchers are using in their analyses, right? So that relates to the kind of the trend that I've said to more and more quantitative work or formal theory. Um, but they also um, note what they, what they see as a problem within co-authorship co practices that... Um, you get, uh, if, if there's a kind of, I mean, increasingly um, political science articles are uh, authored by groups of people. It's not just single authored. You might have a group of, you know, two, three, four, five uh, people who've worked together contributing different aspects of the work. Um, where women are um, uh, co-authoring articles, um, it's much more likely to be uh, a mixed group of men and women. But when, where men are co-authoring articles, it's much more commonly likely to be an all-male group, right? So this, there seems to be something going on in terms of 
who gets invited <laughs> to form part of the kind of the collective that is co-authoring uh, an article, and that, that they suggest is one of the one of the issues there. So just just to sum up the way I kind of see the current period, um, I think particularly within political theory, um, thinking of now compared with when I first started out as a kind of post PhD student and you know starting on my ac academic career, there's far more willingness to accept feminist work as legitimate, right? I mean, you can be a feminist political theorist and it's not regarded as a joke, right? Um, uh, so there's much greater kind of uh, uh, willingness to accept this. I think there's more recognition within um, politics departments generally um, about problems such as uh, agenda citation bias, a kind of ways in which um, the kind of the... Uh, Articles by men tend to cite other men, whereas articles by women tend to cite women and men, and that you know that the kind of the, the cumulative effect is is uh, a significant gender citation bias or the journal publication bias. You know, and in my own department, uh, many of my male colleagues are you know um, you know read the material on this and uh, you know are kind of troubled by it and you know think about what they can do in relation to their uh, curricula in terms of trying to kind of address this. So much more kind of willingness to accept feminist work as legitimate, more recognition of problems such as gender citation bias. But also in some ways less receptiveness to feminist approaches so that in terms of integrating them, mainstreaming them, so that it's not just those who think of themselves as feminists <laughs> who actually use gender in their analysis. Um, in a way, the transformative work of gender, in some ways, is becoming more difficult because of what I started out with in terms of some of the current trends within political science and political theory towards greater abstraction and away from more interdisciplinary work. Interdisciplinary is a kind of odd one because, um, I mean, again, I'm, I'm talking particularly about my, uh, my own uh, university context in the UK all the kind of the, you know, the major organizations of higher education and, and my own university are always saying how important it is to do interdisciplinary work. And uh, they're all, all kind of calling on us to, to do this. And yet, actually, you don't get much um, credit <laughs> for doing work which is interdisciplinary. So it's, it's an odd kind of moment. Um, and I think, final point, um, just thinking about the experience for yourselves as you, you know, work your way through uh, academic institutions. Uh, the institutional pressures can translate into a kind of self-censorship. I mean, it's quite hard to, um, it's quite hard to kind of feel embattled <laughs> uh, in your research work against dominant trends, right? Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, I think in a way, certain forms of kind of self-censorship work begin to kind of operate in terms of the issues that you decide to work on. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm very much aware of this myself, that um, uh, though, I mean, I mean, I define myself as a feminist political theorist, um, but I don't, I don't want to be just talking about gender all the time, right? <laughs> um, uh, and that's, that's partly because everything around me tells me if you just talk about gender all the time, actually you're talking about something rather peripheral and rather marginal, and nobody wants to be peripheral and marginal. Um, so uh, there are those institutional pressures, I think, continue, even though I think we're in a period more generally in which there's much greater recognition uh, of the importance of mainstreaming gender. I think perhaps there's more recognition of the importance of mainstreaming gender, but possibly less recognition of the difficulties of doing it. And that, that's kind of part of the challenge that we face. So that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's the, all I had to, had to say. So, um, so, open for discussion, really. Last meeting, 
microphone, even if we could hear, because the um, the present the, the workshop is being recorded, and it can only be recorded if we use the microphone. Okay, so if any of you um, has a problem with the recording, just um, just tell us. It's only be of academic use to provide others with the opportunity to, to follow the um, workshop as well. So um, I can pass the mic. I had a question, right? Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Ana Costa. I'm doing a PhD in law mm -hmm. from the Department of Philosophy of Law at UPF. Right. Uh, I'm studying regulation of prostitution. That is my ah, topic. Right, right, <laughs> yes. And so ha can't avoid gender on that one. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, well, I, I'm originally from Portugal, but I spent most of my adult life in Brazil. And I think that made me see questions of inequality on a very different way, mm -hmm. right? My interest on my topic, uh, um, well, it was born in Brazil because right now there's a proposal to regulate prostitution. And, well, that caught my attention mm. for all the, cir the specific circumstances in there. And so my, my question was somehow broadly, and I, I, I'm not sure I can put it in the best way, but we've been talking here about how in political theory many of the questions we treat, we study, are kind of masked as if they were neut yeah. neutral in yeah. many senses and of course in gender terms. Um, and we, we of course want and we think it's very fruitful to have a gender approach. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But when I, in my topic, mm -hmm. start uh, studying feminist um, literature and of course, uh, connecting with the background mm, uh, mm. of Brazilian society. What my impression, my first impression is that many times feminist literature also departs from uh, abstract notions such who is the woman we mm. are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that becomes very uh, clear to me, at least in this very beginning, when we talk about prostitution. Because talking about prostitution in Europe is very different yeah. from talking about prostitution in Brazil, for yeah. instance. And the, the specific social legal conditions we have there um, are very different from the ones we have here in general, of course. And when I see feminists treating the topic as if that treatment could be applied universally, uh, yeah. That for me is very problematic, yeah. and I, can, I come to think that the problem we have in general, in political theory, in law, uh, about this abstract subject that we obviously see everywhere, I also see it in feminist literature. And, and that became the huge problem uh, quality and to equality policy. So I don't know, I would, I would like to, to ask your, your help. Yeah, I think that, that's a kind of excellent point. And uh, I mean, it, it, it relates to the kind of the, uh, the second issue, which I just indicated, but didn't say uh, anything substantive about, about a further problem is needing to challenge <coughs> essentialisms of gender, of culture, of nation. Um, I think that, I mean, I think within the feminist literature, there is growing awareness of precisely the point that you are making about the kind of the, the dangers of, you know, challenging, <laughs> challenging the kind of the abstract individual, but then putting in place of the abstract individual an abstract woman and an abstract man, uh, which, which then um, both uh, completely um, obscures <coughs> all kinds of crucial differences in the different location of women, and that's the whole literature on intersectionality in particular addresses that, but also the point that you're making about the way it, it obscures the specific national context, particularly for anyone who's trying to work in relation to policy areas. You know, one, one really has to kind of think about those. So I, I very much agree with the, the observation that you're making that this kind of you know, this, this critique of abstraction, if it only goes to the point of replacing, you know, the kind of the supposedly gender neutral individual by 
some kind of abstract category of women from which we derive uh, what ought to be the appropriate policies is is it's uh, is is not um, it's not exactly kind of moving us forward. I do think that there's a very rich uh, debate about this and literature on this now within the kind of the, the feminist literature, but, uh, but I think the point that you're making is, uh, is very well taken, yeah, and definitely needs to be added into this discussion, yes. Ah, it's, uh, it's noisy. Yes, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you turn it off? So, uh, uh, thanks. So, um, so, so thanks. Um, I need to explain a bit of my background so that, uh, and, and, and then I will maybe make a small comment or question, but. Uh, so I work in, a, in this department, computer science and mm. technologies, and uh, my, my research, uh, I mean, one big part of my research is about um, fairness in predictive modeling, mm -hmm. right? So we have uh, many applications of artificial intelligence or machine learning that they basically analyze data and they produce a prediction using this data. And uh, we look at ways in which this prediction can uh, be disadvantages to a certain group, can be discriminatory ah, right. in the sense of, right. uh, yes. for instance, consistently reproducing historical patterns of discrimination, yeah. which is the, mo the, the most obvious way of, of mm. understanding this is that, well, if you are learning, if you're having a computer program learn from past decisions on how to emulate human behavior, then it can also emulate things that you maybe you don't want to, to continue doing but, and, and even reinforce those, right? So. And there are many examples of, of that in, in hiring, in uh, access to university, access to education, and, in, uh, and also in, uh, in criminal justice, yes. right. uh, and so on. And then yeah. there have been studies showing how um, an artificial intelligence, or a, basically a data-driven algorithm, can reinforce this yeah. discrimination, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, one of, the, one of the interesting, let's say, advances of this uh, field, so to speak, which has been going on for the last uh, maybe five to ten years in computer science has been this, this idea that uh, if you don't capture uh, the, the attributes that you sh should not be discriminating on, such as gender or race, then uh, you will never know that you're discriminating, yes. and it will be very hard also to mitigate discrimination. But at the same time, there is a reason why when you go and ask for a, a loan at the bank, they don't ask you your race. Yeah. And, 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 and so there, there, there is a tension there between, in one hand, on one hand, the need to pretend that your outcome is going to be neutral, mm. which from the data science perspective, we know it, it will not. So the fact that you don't tell the bank that you are white or black or whatever race doesn't mean that a predictive model will know that you are black or white. The, the predictive model can know very easily because your, your race and other protected attributes are heavily correlated with a lot of other variables you are disclosing. Mm -hmm. So there is no point, uh, technically, in computing, in computing terms, there is no point of ah, okay. yeah. race or gender yeah, yeah, form yeah. because the system will act as yes. if it knew, knows your gender yeah, or race yeah, anyway, right, right. Right? With, with very high accuracy. Right. So, there is no point in hiding the variable, but there is a political point in hiding this variable, which is, well, you yes. shouldn't be asking. Yes. But there is yes. also, like, the other side, how, how, they may, how can I detect that I'm discriminating, and how can I mitigate these things? So yes. it's a very complicated yes. thing yes. from, from the operation yeah. of, 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 uh, of these things. Uh, but, but, the, but the current research goes into the, I mean, the current research is heavily states, okay, you, we need to start capturing somehow this data. Maybe we anonymize it, maybe we keep it separate so that people don't believe that we are using or not in the decision, but we need to start, yeah, start capturing yeah, this data. Yeah. Now, uh, the, but, okay, that, that's the setting. Now, the, the, I, I, find it, I find it very hard to, to find collaborators across disciplines to work on this uh, type of things because of different rhythms and, and, and different concerns. So I work in, in, in this area because it is being done right now. So it's not a matter of whether in 10 years or 20 years 
hiding decisions or admission to university or whatever is going to be influenced by a mathematical model. It is, in, 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 in many senses, yeah. At, yeah. right now. Yes. So the very fact that you, even things that don't look like artificial intelligence, such as when you apply for a university, you have certain scores in different tests and right. they have certain weights, those weights are a mathematical model and the way in which you tune those weights changes, uh, has effects that are gender specific. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for instance, uh, one, uh, I know of one case of a, of a university in, in Chile where they wanted more women students in engineering. So what they did was to increase the weight of high school grades in the combination of the score that allows you to right, enter the university, right. yes. which yes. is, and, and they will be very, very, uh, let's say, open about this. They will say, we are changing this weight yeah. because yeah. we want more women to be stu students. Yeah. Yeah. And this has generated no controversy at all. Yes. While another university decides to, uh, for instance, reserve a few, a block of positions for yeah, yeah, women yes, students, yes. and it's heavily yeah, controversial, yeah, yes, yes. even though perhaps the effect it has in yeah, distorting yeah. the original population is less. Yes. So there is a, a, there is this, com there is this, okay, this algorithm that is embedded in a certain political reality, uh, in a certain data, uh, and it, it, it has many, many aspects, and I, I don't, I find it, uh, Again, I, I, don't, I don't even know where to start to, mm -hmm. to, to, to find this collaboration across disciplines because the rhythms are different and because people want, I mean, we need to operationalize things. So I, I, I need to start creating models. Mm -hmm. uh, this, mm -hmm. is, this is my, my, my purpose. I, I, I cannot, because the models are being created anyways and they are discriminatory. So I want to propose my own that are not discriminatory or mm -hmm. that they mitigate certain things I see. Now, mm -hmm. because now it's, these things are happening while, um, Maybe more philosophy as advances at another rhythm, uh, mm. uh, and, and 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 also there is and this, with this I finish. There is also like the the a certain pretension of being universal in computer science, of having some some algorithms that can apply everywhere, yes. while uh, legal definitions and legal requirements uh, are are not uni and very varied from country to country, even inside a country. So. Uh, there is a lot of mismatch. I find it very hard to, to establish this sort of uh, collaboration. Um, would you have any advice? Okay, right. No, I, that's, that's kind of fascinating. So actually, I, I would have thought that a lot of the people, some of them would be in law and some in, in political theory who've, who work on the complexities of affirmative action, you know, who are precisely dealing with... Um, uh, with that kind of that uh, that tension between um, ways in which one one simultaneously wants to kind of both uh, ignore and incorporate uh, aspects relating to gender, race, sexuality, and so on, um, it seems to me that uh, that what you're describing resonates very very closely with some of those concerns. I mean, in in France, for example, where um, for for you know. I mean, there's this long tradition of not collecting data on race, ethnicity, um, because of a kind of conception that, you know, sort of citizenship in France is universal. And, uh, you know, a very strong statement about it does not matter whether you are X, Y, Z. If you're a citizen of France, that's what matters. With um, sociologically, one of the kind of unfortunate consequences being that uh, France actually produced minimal data on the uh, distribution of inequalities within society, the highly racialized character of, uh, of poverty and housing distribution and so on. And so there have been, um, you know, quite a lot of people, you know, working in the, in the universities in France, putting together the case <laughs> for a, a different approach to data collection, uh, which will enable people to um, to to um, to collect that data without it being taken as a kind of uh, now you are treated as a kind of different subgroup of the uh, of the of the community. So I, I, that that would be the kind of the the closest kind of parallel to me. But I think I think what's uh, I mean it is really fascinating what you say about how much the how the 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 gendering of our lives. Is, is so pervasive that without including 
the specific information about people's gender, one can basically predict almost kind of perfectly from all the other things about us, uh, whether we're male or female. That really astonishes me that it's kind of quite that, um, quite that deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's so, so that's a very that's yeah. a very robust results in in, yeah. in terms of uh, in terms of data science with yes. respect to gender and other demographic characteristics. Yes. So uh, even when the I, the initial I would say the initial research project of this community mm. was to 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 take those things out. Yes, and and the naive way of doing that was, was to, just to take the to, are you male or female? Yeah, yes, out, and yeah. then it it really it quickly yeah. uh, was very obvious for and, and this is across many data sets mm. that this is this is not possible. Mm. There mm. is always a dependency. So yeah. instead of yeah. trying to remove it, you need to somehow measure it and try yeah. to mitigate it. Yes. And, yeah. and and yeah. it's not. It, it's not it's really not a matter of, it's not magic, it's, it's, it's just obvious that many, yes, many absolutely. things, yes, the same yeah. as age and gender yeah. and race yeah. Yeah. Uh, and socioeconomic status, all of those variables, everything is related to everything yes. in your life yeah. and yeah. the other attributes tell, tell you very quickly yeah. what, what you are, yeah. even yeah. sexual orientation. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you, you had another question, am I right? Or, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I don't think it works. Yes, it's working. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, I think to speak yeah. uh, louder. Um, I, I would uh, very much uh, like to know your, your opinion about these other trends, feminist trends, I think, theoretical feminist trends that comes pro um, probably more from cultural studies mm -hmm. which are very anti-identitarian uh, and that uh, questions the uh, binarism of gender and uh, as a consequence would uh, ask for a very um, different approach uh, which, which is not uh, to, ma to abstract uh, the subject, but at the very same time, it's uh, um, it's also um, uh, we we could end in in this abstraction of 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 our identities. Uh, I don't I don't know if this kind of debates uh, uh, in your department in your university um, have arrived, and, mm. and what's your position about it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so these debates don't go on in my uh, politics department, definitely not, uh, but they do go on, obviously, among the gender scholars, uh, for example, at the Gender Institute at, uh, at LSE. Um, and, um, I mean, I think the... I mean, there's, there's huge theoretical point to the critique of the, of the binary, right? Um, uh, partly connecting with some of the things that you're saying about the kind of the the ways in which if we simply replace the kind of the, the individual by the, the figure of the, <laughs> the man and the woman, that this, this kind of totally fails to kind of capture the, uh, the complexity of our, um, you know, multiple situation. Uh, but also that the, um, the ways in which it can encourage a kind of, uh, a kind of, a kind of politics in which you just situate yourself within what you take to be your identity group, which might get a smaller, become a smaller and smaller sub-identity group, but that's still not, uh, not addressing the issues. The problem always comes down to um, actually uh, operationalizing, I mean, translating any of this into useful uh, policy work. And, uh, and I think that that for me is the is the point at which um, a, a point at which the kind of in a sense the the quite powerful theoretical critique seems to me to stop. And very often the people who have been best at developing that theoretical critique have not been terribly helpful in terms of then moving on to so what what actually is the implication of that in terms of how one. Uh, uh, how one transforms um, uh, 
uh, laws, uh, how one transforms institutions, what kind of policies one might adopt in relation to data or you know prostitution or um, so so I think uh, I, yeah I, I think we're at a kind of point I mean I, I definitely find this in my in my own work of a kind of um, a a kind of sharing of many of the theoretical concerns that's coming out of that literature, but a kind of an awareness that I then fall back on something that is much cruder uh, when it comes to thinking about policy. So I personally don't think that I have kind of managed to, <laughs> uh, to marry those two. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm aware of anyone <laughs> who actually has, and if you have, then do tell me. <laughs> but uh, but I, think, I think that that seems to me the challenge. It's, and, and actually, there's some very interesting um, work that's done about, um, particularly about law, about the way in which law seems to force us back into um, kind of simpler categories and kind of binaries, that somehow it's almost the way in which law operates is to um, ensnare us in that. Uh, and I think one could say that more generally in terms of policy, not just in kind of the legislation, though it's, it's stronger with the, the codifications of something in law and the codifications of something in policy don't lend themselves very well to the kind of theoretical interventions that you're talking about. So that's where we're stuck, because we need law, we need policy, <laughs> um, and, uh, and trying, to, trying to work out a way of, uh, um, of addressing addressing issues. So, so if you think about, um, I mean, one example of this would be the way in which uh, equality policy gets translated into human resources terms so that you get, uh, so people raise issues about um, uh, people aren't just male or female. Um, there's a whole kind of, uh, you know, range of kind of gender locations that we might identify ourselves with, or people aren't just black or white, you know, there's a whole kind of range of kind of ethnic categorizations that we might make. And the, the human resources response is simply to multiply the number of boxes that you tick, right? So that you collect data which is, you know, more and more diverse um, in order to try and kind of identify this. And it seems to me that that's not that's not really solving the problem, but it's a kind of, it's an example of the way in which a kind of a, 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 a theoretical argument, when you try to make the move to translate it into something that has some kind of policy impact, actually turns into yet another box <laughs> um, and, and, and yet another kind of very um, unhelpful categorization. So, so I, I definitely recognize the problem that you are raising. Um, yeah. Thanks for, for your talk. And um, we, we see an increasing um, interest from colleagues or, or students in well, trying to see how they can mainstream gender into their research, but there's still a huge conflation between sex and gender, right? So they, many people might think that because they have included the variable sex, they are really complying with um, the basics of integrating the gender um, dimensions. And um, so first of all, what would be your advice? You know, a very short answer to these colleagues that say, I do mainstream gender because I uh, include both men and women in my samples or when I yes, uh, yes, produce um, yes, a regression yes. model, sex yes. is a variable included yes, there, right? Yes, I know yes. it's a very simple question, yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. Th this is an answer we yeah. need to, to yes. be able to provide very clearly of why yeah. one thing does not equal the other, yes. right? Yeah. The other thing is that, and I've always find it difficult as well, especially in providing short answers, um, English is a great language in terms of having these words that um, are short but have a very complex meaning like engendering, regendering, which in Spanish do not exist. You need a full sentence. 
to explain what engendering means or mm -hmm. regendering means, right? So even if it's um, um, you as an English native speaker, how would you provide a very short definition of engender and regender, right? That doesn't need these two or three sentences to, to be explained. Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to be able to do that, all right. <laughs> but, <laughs> so that's asking too much of an academic to kind of say everything in kind of, you know, one short sentence. But um, on, on the kind of first point, I, I'm not sure it's a matter of um, the kind of... Uh, the elision between sex and gender, maybe it is, but I think what, what you're pointing to in your first question is about the um, thinking that you can treat gender as a kind of variable um, that you can then feed into your statistical models, which, which f f to me really fails to see the way in which gender is structural. It's, a, it's about a whole set of relations and structures um, I mean, this is confirmed by your point about the way in which if you just take out the male and female, there are all these other things about the kind of the, the institutions and the structures through which we live our lives that, you know, that, that create us as masculine and feminine, uh, often against our will, <laughs> um, and, and which have kind of extraordinary impact. So I think, I think part of what seems to me to be the, the idea that you can... Um, that you can, you can think of kind of, of gender as a variable, right? As if it could be kind of, um, you know, one of the things about the data that we plug in or we plug out. Um, to me, it doesn't really get to grips with the sense in which we're dealing with a, a sort of structures of power which are, which go through all of the kind of the relations of our lives. They have they have a sort of stronger impact on some of them than on others. It's not as though, you know, gender is equally um, significant to every single aspect of our lives. But so, so for me, that it, it's not, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it comes, it comes through in kind of thinking about it as sex or gender because sex is a variable, yeah. Uh, it, it, it sort of translates into something simple. Are you male or female? You know, do you have statistics on this? Um, but it, that doesn't begin to address uh, what are the kind of the, the multiple structures and institutions through which gender operates, um, which is, so, so I think for those, for those of you who work with much more um, data-driven type research, one of the real challenges, which I can't kind of say very much about because it's not my kind of field, but one of the real challenges is, is is how to kind of work out what is being captured in, in data which inevitably is, is simply um, uh, is pulling out of a very much larger context certain bits of information which are then useful for the, uh, for the particular statistic. So, so that, that's, that's my, in fact, extremely long-winded answer to, <laughs> to the question about why... Um, I mean, essentially, the reason why think it's not enough to sort of solve the problem by uh, adding in um, women as the data of women as well as the data of men is because it doesn't address the structural nature of gender. Um, and, and the kind of, it's, it's paralleled in the, in the more political theory literature by the idea that you address the problem by uh, adopting gender neutral language uh, without actually addressing the kind of the, the structural nature of gender in the way in which political theory concepts have been, uh, have been constructed. Um, as to... Yeah, I, 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 I don't know that... Uh, I think the thing about engendering or regendering, um, I think probably what's, what's important to convey is that it's not a matter of putting in something that wasn't previously there, right? It's a matter of making explicit. I mean, gender is there. In, if, you, if you're engaged in, whether it's politics, law, whatever kind of area of, of, of you know, the world that you're trying to understand, gender is already there. 
and the kind of the, uh, the engendering or regendering isn't a matter of putting something in that wasn't previously there. It's a matter of making, uh, making more visible uh, in a way that allows us to get a better understanding, something that is already there. And so I think that, that's an important part of, of what... Uh, so in a sense, it's not optional. You know, it's not as though you can say, well, I'm, somebody else can put the gender in. I, I work on doing other things because it's, it's, if it's already there in the material, we need to be able to kind of make sense of that and understand it and, and recognize the way in which it's kind of distorting our analyses. But yeah, sorry, that was definitely not short. <laughs> I think it was sufficiently short to, to make it um, more resistant or yeah. just... Um, uh, it, it was perfect to, to, to explain it to non-experts um, or um, yeah. colleagues not already sensitive or uh, with skills to apply gender-sensitive research. I think it worked very well, thank you. Are there any... Um, other questions? Um, well, I actually have two questions, and I'll try to make it short. Uh, Higher, sorry. sorry. Uh, so the first, uh, relating to the matter of language, uh, is, well, uh, when we try somehow in our daily lives to, to make a point about how the use of the masculine as neutral, mm. uh, actually, so to mm. encompass mm. both men and women, uh, we are often perceived as these crazy <laughs> feminists who in everything have to bring in the topic, yes. no? Yes. And for me, it, it, it's difficult in the sense that I don't actually know from a, strate a strategical point of view what to do. Mm. So mm. if we are engaged in these kind of topics, it's not something only that we keep in yeah, our research yeah, yeah. and we write about, but we can detach from it in our lives, in our daily lives. It's something that we don't even yeah. want, right? Yes. But yeah. then how to do that uh, when, um, well, I have the impression that in some places more than others, there is this uh, negative reaction to the idea of feminism, not the, the, the idea of uh, feminist ideology. Mm, mm. So when we have such a negative, conservative, yeah. Uh, reply to to the the little uh, I don't know if I can put it this way the the little uh, results in terms of mainstreaming gender mm. what to do about mm. it should mm. we just continue um, pointing at it all the time or should we adopt some kind of other strategies because in the end of the day we don't want to keep yeah. our issues between ourselves on the opposite we want to yeah. somehow change people's minds and what is the best mm -hmm. way to mm -hmm. do that mm -hmm. yeah 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 <laughs> um okay so uh i think i think both in terms of what people can cope with themselves and in terms of strategy to be the person who in every meeting in every lecture in every kind of discussion is the one who raises issues about gender, is kind of is is very um, is very undermining, right? I mean, you kind of you feel that you just you're turning yourself in, into their stereotype, right? And and that kind of in a sense, what you speak is diminished by the fact that people say, oh yes, she's the, always the one who raises these points. So it's kind of it's it's almost impossible to, to be that kind of person because. You just, I mean, maybe, I, I think, I, actually, there are some people who manage this, but I don't manage it, right? So I kind of very often find I, I just sort of, I really do not want to be the one who raises the gender issues in this discussion um, because of the way in which you know that you get pigeonholed and actually what you say is taken less seriously. On the other hand, <laughs> if somebody else doesn't jump in, and, and do it, which is the best solution, <laughs> um, then, then by remaining silent, you're allowing things to pass that really shouldn't pass. So, so there, isn't, there isn't a kind of an easy, either, either for one's personal kind of psychological health <laughs> or in terms of what's effective strategy, there isn't an easy solution to that other than, 
you know, hopefully there's enough people around so that it doesn't always have to be you who raises the gender issues. But I think, I think being, able to, um, being able to kind of formulate the arguments that you want to make in terms in which sometimes are much more gender heavy and sometimes are actually, they're sort of, you're making similar kinds of points but you're perhaps framing them in different ways or you're kind of, um, is, is one of the kind of strategies that people use. But I think, I think, I think you're right that it, it's, 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 it's an inevitable commentary of the world that we inhabit that if you are the one who just keeps going on about gender all the time, in the end you become less effective. Yeah, and, it's yeah, so and, and I mean, yeah. independently yeah. of, of yeah. like the personal level, yeah, how yeah. people perceive yeah, yes. me, uh, my, my concern is also like on policy terms. For yeah. instance, a good example is yeah. the Colombian peace agreement in which a language was adopted that always include not he, but he and she. And yes. that made the agreement much bigger in terms of page numbers, no? And so there was a big um, discussion on that and how it was perceived empty and silly uh, just to have to add uh, the she every time we were referring to a person just to make a point that included both men and women. And how that instead of having at least an immediate po uh, positive uh, consequence actually was the opposite because it kind of raised this this attitude of how crazy and silly it is that we always have to include, at least in terms of language, but of course not only, um, the she, because we already know that in this kind of language, uh, the he includes the she. And so what I mean is, also in terms of policy, um, in what comes to language, but of course not only, there is sometimes a, a bad um, reaction to the inclusion of the gender concerns. And so in terms of policy, I also uh, keep asking myself what could be done to address that, okay. that uh, bad reaction. Okay, I think at some point, one, uh, there are lots of contexts in which you just have to face the reaction, right? <laughs> I mean, if one, if one worries about the backlash all the time, you never say anything. So uh, Personally, I think, I think the language thing is actually very important and, and, and should be addressed. Um, I mean, I, let me give a, um, an, an example that, that um, I, th I think I'm right in saying that uh, in, in France was the, uh, the first country in 2000 um, to introduce legislation uh, that required uh, all political parties uh, to address the question of gender proportionality in terms of um, uh, the uh, uh, selecting candidates uh, at, at that point, uh, primarily for municipal elections and the elections to the European Parliament. Now, I have been, for many, many years, a very strong supporter of gender quotas as a way of uh, addressing the underrepresentation of women in politics. But at that point, so 2000, um, I still thought this is a risky thing to do. Uh, it's much better to work for caucuses of women, to work through their individual political parties, to win support among their colleagues, to get their parties voluntarily to adopt some kind of action. Uh, much better to do that than to have a top-down insistence that all parties must do this. So to, in the year 2000, yeah, absolutely. Because what I'm saying is, I mean, I, I've, I've changed my mind, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, but, and, and it, it's, it's now, of course, become uh, much more uh, common across, across Europe. A number of European countries um, have now uh, adopted that kind of legislation. And I now very much wish that my own country would do it. Um, but I, I, I think I was too preoccupied with worries about the backlash at that time. Um, to, in a sense, have the kind of the courage and the confidence <laughs> to think that this was a necessary stage forward. So there are judgments that have to be made. I mean, just the fact that there can be a backlash against anything that we want. If it's, if it's, if it's important, <laughs> there will be a backlash, right? I mean, if it's something that, that disrupts existing 
um, structures of power or privilege, of course there will be a backlash. So it's not as though any time there's a backlash, one stops, right? But so there are judgments to be made about, um, about how to be most effective, but they can't be, just be whenever you spot the, the risk of a backlash, then, then you say, well, this can't be the right strategy. Something you mentioned at the beginning was about uh, why political theory doesn't uh, say kind of abstract gender and race. Um, this is not my area, so it's yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. sorry if the question is naive. But uh, so uh, what will it look at if it if it does? Like, uh, and, and I was thinking like uh, in the extreme, like could a constitution uh, have gender? Uh, have, have differential rights for different genders, right? So, or have differential obligations, different obligations for different genders. So, the cons uh, perhaps the consequence of, of trying to create a political theory that incorporates gender is the yeah. fact that you may yeah. have an outcome which yeah. uh, have different rights and different responsibilities, and maybe that's not what you want. No, no, yeah, know, yeah. Right? absolutely not what I want. Um, so, so that, so that's the kind of the um, that's the complexity of. Um, making gender a kind of something which is, uh, which is visible and which can then be kind of, uh, can then inform the way in which you are analyzing the society and the kinds of policies that you're proposing without the kind of essentializing of gender which lends itself to distinct rights and responsibilities for, you know, for men and for women. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think that's an impossible thing to do, and I think, I think that's, that's actually what, um, within feminist political theory, that's kind of, in, in effect, that's the, that's the kind of the problem that is being addressed throughout uh, feminist political theory, and I think, you know, in, in ways that uh, I think are, are broadly effective. But that's always the kind of the, that's always hovering on the edge of the anxiety and that's why, of course, there's so much appeal to the gender-neutral position. That's why kind of, you know, many, many people would want to say the, the thing to press is the insignificance of gender, right? Let's get gender out of the picture because then we can get rid of the idea of, you know, different rights and responsibilities. Um, but the problem is that if you just do that, you simply don't address the fact that gender remains a kind of key structuring uh, principle of our societies. So yeah, so that, that absolutely is the challenge. But I think it's a challenge that is very fully recognized in the literature and in fact drives much of the, much of the work that goes on is you know, how, to, how to make gender visible without turning it into another source of power over us, um, which is, is how I might put that. That was short. Make gender visible without turning it into a form of power over us. <laughs> in your search for slogans. Thank <laughs> uh, you. Huh? Thank you for the interesting talk. I'm a master's student in migration studies, mm -hmm. and I found the theorizing attempt from gender perspective is quite rare in migration studies. Right. Um, there are many researches uh, based on empirical studies on violence against women, yes. or like victims of human trafficking, or like child migration abuse cases um, targeting young girls. But they are great contribution and uh, step forward, of course, but um, they tend to fall into a specific topic yes, rather yes, than an yes, approach. Yeah. So their, um, uh, the unit of analysis is an agenda, mm -hmm. but yeah. the topic is women. Yes, absolutely. So you yes. can analyze like uh, um, male migra migrants from gender perspective, mm. but it's very difficult to find this kind of a, um, uh, attempt or mm -hmm. like a relevant literature. Is something inevitable or why it's so difficult to reveal the, 
the gender relation and um, power structure mm. and surrounding this and uh, how the discourse emerged out of this, what you just uh, mentioned, yeah. why yeah. it's so difficult? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> it's, it's similar to the kind of point about including um, gender as a variable in one's kind of collection of data, which then, actually it's slightly different from that because what you're describing is much more a kind of like a ghettoization of, uh, of gender issues that, uh, uh, that operate. So say within, uh, within, within political science, so there's, an area, there's now a kind of legitimate area of study which is gender and politics, but it's seen as a kind of a study of women in politics or a study of political parties in relation to gender issues or, a, you know, and, and it, it's, it just happily coexists alongside all the other work that is done in political science as a, as a separate matter. So, um, so it's not just in migration studies that you have that. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the easiest way to start putting gender in is through that um, identifying areas where it is obvious that you have to think about gender. And the, and, but of course the problem is that if that's all that happens, then it, then it remains very much uh, separate from the, uh, the major areas. So, I mean, that's, that I suppose is what, what's behind the idea of mainstreaming, is, is precisely to think about how one moves from the being able to include areas where anyone's going to see that you've got to think about kind of gender, you know, like if you're talking about human trafficking, for example, um, to the, the, the really challenging next stage of actually mainstreaming gender through all aspects. And I should say, I'm, I'm kind of... So, say, in international relations... Um, in the, uh, do any of you do international relations? So, in international relations, uh, there's been quite a strong... Um, which connects, I guess, with migration studies quite well. There's been, there's been quite a strong and effective integration of gender issues into international relations. So that there's a lot of gender research going on, a lot of gender scholars working in the field of international relations. But actually, if you look at what they work on, they work on questions of militarism um, very, very, very commonly. Or they work on questions of uh, gender relations in conflict zones. So it's very similar to what you're describing, that the, the way in to incorporate gender into international relations has been much more about defining, identifying certain areas of the work which lend themselves most easily to some kind of gender analysis. Now, it, it's possible that there are aspects of social research where gender is not relevant. I mean, I allow that as a possibility, you know, that there's going to be variations. It seems plausible that there will be variations about what places where it's absolutely centrally important and other places where it's significant but in a different way. So I allow that as a possibility, but it seems to me <laughs> it's, 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 kind of, it's quite a remote possibility. Um, but I think, I think that problem that you're describing is, is characteristic throughout all of the, um, the areas of research. That the, you know, what tends to happen is that, first of all, gender researchers manage to carve out a space in which there are kind of the obvious, obvious connections, you know, like in international relations, the study of militarism. You know, there are, it's, it's very clear that there's a very rich area there to talk about uh, gender issues. Um, it, it, it may be, it, it works less, it's, it's a much more challenging task uh, in some other areas of international relations. So again, I do not have an answer to you. I mean, what you're identifying is a problem, which I think, I think crops up in uh, in much of uh, much of the areas of social research that we're all engaged in. Many thanks, um, um, Dr. Phillips, and many thanks to all to all of you. Um, if that's okay, if there are, there's no other question, maybe we could um, finish it here. Let me publicize um, as well the next event. Um, and Phillips is presenting, it's in about an hour. Uh, she's giving a lecture on feminism, democracy, and rep republicanism. 
uh, very interesting uh, topic. Um, the conference is not going to take place uh, in the UPF, but rather, well, it's one of the UPF um, uh, centres adscrits. It's in the AITEC, Carre Balmes Centre Antado. So you are all welcome as well to um, to participate in the in the conference. And now that I also have the microphone. Um, in the next few days, probably next week or so, the Quality Unit will be announcing the activities that um, we'll be having for the International Day Against Gender-Based Violence, so you are all welcome to participate, and still you would be on time to provide us with some ideas on specific activities you would like to, to see happening these days as well. So thank you very much, and let's um, give a applause.